We're back. Long time no speak, my friend. How are you? Doing great, Tom. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, last time we spoke, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, you had about 20,000 followers. (laughs) <laughs> and at the very end of the podcast, and this wasn't that long ago either, this was early 2019. So it's not a whole lot of time, you know, and at the very end of that podcast, we spoke about heroes and we're speaking about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. And I likened the impact that you were making um, to to someone emulating a hero because you're not doing it only for yourself because, you know, you're, you're, you, you've taken the first steps. You've made those first steps of doing the work and I'm excited to get into your book as well. But um, you're doing this purely for other people and creating a movement and self-healers. And uh, boy, did, uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't realize it was going to get as big as it has, but uh, just congratulations, Nicole. It's so cool. Thank you. I think you and I both are, are quite surprised. I don't know if I would have imagined back. I, I don't know if I would have imagined back then that I would have had those 20,000 followers. I think I probably shared with you then I had little expectation of what would come of it. Um, speaking online really for me was an exercise for my own healing journey around speaking my truth personally and professionally. So for me, it's it, it blew any expectation I ever could have had about whom would do whatever with that with that that truth. Um, from the very beginning. So I'm mind blown. It's been a journey. And for me, it continues, however, to be affirming, to be really affirming of what I think is, is are quite universal truth, quite universal struggles, um, and now quite universal inspirational stories and empowerment and healing that I think, regardless of where you are around the world at this point, you resonate with to some extent. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that, that's a, a really great segue. Cause I was going to ask like, what, what do you think it is um, that you're tapping into here? You know, these universal truths, these trauma bonds, you know, struggles with, with, with family dynamics and all that kind of stuff. But I'd love for you to touch on that. Yeah. I think that the, the what I'm speaking, like I said, is, is let me reiterate too universal truth that has been spoken before. Um, however, I think part of it and what makes um, the account and my work uh, appealing is it's spoken in an understandable and someone used the word to me yesterday that I was speaking with applicable. Mm. And what I mean when I say that is I've read books that have a lot of the concepts that I speak about, like this idea of ego and consciousness. And maybe a lot of us have heard these things before, um, though I don't think that they were heard in an, a way that was had utility. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of describe it as their concepts. And for me too, they were out there. They were great in theory. They were ideas. What does this really mean? What is it, what is it to live consciously versus on autopilot or unconsciously? What does ego look like? Mm-hmm. Right? We can theorize and we can understand something out there. And then we can understand something in a way that we can use it, metabolize it, mm-hmm. gain wisdom through the lived experience of doing it. And In my old life, when I was just, you know, I was working as a clinical psychologist, practicality, applicability was always something on my mind. How do I help my client, that it was at the time, go out and do something with what we're talking about? Um, And I always knew to some extent that that was going to be part of the story. I don't believe I did it as successfully back then because I didn't have the whole understanding of why we can't go out and make change that I do now. (laughs) Um, though, like I said, I believe that that's part of the work that feels so appealing now and the way I speak about it online, I think is helping people build that bridge. Mm. Oh, this doesn't feel so elusive anymore. This concept of say ego, I know what it is. I can see it in my, I can witness it in my daily life. And now I can begin to utilize this tool to create change. Mm, That's such a good point because, uh, you know, even when you, you read back on some of the religious stories, you know. Some, some of that needs an update. It's like, do unto thee as, are you just saying, don't be a dickhead? Right. Okay. (laughs) Now I understand. Okay, cool. But you're exactly right. What is being conscious and and what is, um, you know, how to manage your ego and how would you, how would you describe those two? Consciousness. Yeah. Let's let's just go deep right away. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) no, I love it. I love it. I mean, consciousness is probably something you'll hear me speaking about right out the gate anyway, because what I believe consciousness is the foundation for change. I believe most of us are living in that autopilot, Mm. bound by the habits and patterns that for many of us were constructed, developed, and practiced from childhood that never got updated. 
Um, so you'll always hear me speaking about consciousness, acknowledging that it's a practice, not a light switch. I don't discover, oh, this concept of consciousness being present. So I'm it. Mm. Absolutely not. Um, many of us have a habit of not even using that, that lobe of our brain, the prefrontal cortex where consciousness lives. So many of us are dropped back in our subconscious, you know, all day long. So consciousness is a practice. Um, we engage it when we're fully present in the present moment. We can learn how to hook our attention from wherever else it was, lost in thought, worrying about yesterday, fearing tomorrow, by focusing on what's here now. Mm. And I always give two suggestions about what's here now, what's ever present. One of them is your breath. Your breath is always present. If we can learn to use our breath as a focal point, we can learn to harness the most powerful thing we have, which is our attention. Mm. And the more attentive and present we are to what's happening here now, the more conscious we become. Um, our senses are another great hook. Senses, what are we seeing, touching, tasting? And then we're moving our bodies. We can use the tactile feeling of movement, um, of smells, of taste, again, to be that anchor. Why do we want to be present? Because we want to be tending to what's here. Um, and presence allows us to create opportunities to make new choices to mm. the future different. Um, so you'll always hear me talking about building that foundational practice. Um, and in doing that, what many of us become conscious to is our ego, yeah. that internal voice or that story about who we think we are or imagine ourselves to be more often than not based in our lived experiences of life. However, as far as I see it, it's a very limited story. We practice telling ourselves time in, day in, day out. So when we become conscious, when we begin to observe ourselves, we see how patterned we are. Mm. We see how habited we become. I call it our habit self. This includes how we are in the world, our general way of being. It includes our internal world and those endless, like I said, egoic narrative stories about us that just so happen to map onto the very real consistent feelings many of us are stuck in. Are you an anxious person? I know I was. Anxiety was pretty much all I felt. I was always some degree of stressed out, mm. right? How manageable. Some of us get stuck in sadness. We're always kind of down or low or sad. Um, so when we become observational and conscious, we can see all of these habits very, very clearly. And again, we can work toward a future where we can expand ourselves and begin to let in newer, more full versions or stories about who we are. Mm. That's awesome. You know, that's, that's so brilliant because it's, yeah, it's so practical the way you just spoke about that. You know, these are, these are pretty, you know, deep psychological ideas, but the way you map that out is, you know, we do, we, and I, I know this, you know, even in my own experience, I was um, anxiety prone as well, you know, just, just getting stuck in worrying and, and thinking that that was not only necessary, but normal. It's, it's normal to be like this, isn't it? And, you, you know, you could probably argue that uh, in today's culture, it kind of is. <laughs> but, um, okay, this is cool. I'm, I'm really excited about this. So um, because of that, one of the things that you like to talk about, obviously, as well, is embodied responses and changing our physiology before we start to change um, some of the more subtler things. Could you talk a little bit about that as well? So our, our physiology and, and what I came to understand why I was struggling so much on the personal side, again, describing me as anxious, I was very stuck in anxious. I couldn't create change. Everything I was doing was waiting for the next shoe to drop. The way I showed up in my relationships was very patterned. Um, it, was, it was very much part of who I am and what I was practicing. And I realized, and this was very against what you would have logically hear me say, what I would have proclaimed for my whole life, really, is, is my little hippie heart. All I want was peace. Mm -hmm. no peace it's like I wanted to have the complete opposite experience of stress that I found myself consistently in. And what I came to realize, and this is why I was struggling to create that change in my life, I couldn't logic my way to that peace. I couldn't find myself comfortable without that stress around me. And then what I would see when I started to work with clients for long enough, see them week after week, year after year, I saw very similar patterns of us being unable to create change despite, for many of us, accumulated consequences mm. of these continued habits and patterns. And what I began to realize is we do get stuck at the level of our physiology. 
Um, and I have a term that I talk about a lot and I call it emotional addiction. Um, and what emotional addiction is, is that familiar physiology now that lives in our bodies. Those familiar experiences that get mapped on, in my opinion, down at the neuronal level, right? Neurons that fire together, wire together. And before long, we have these circuits that kind of feed into. So using my stress and anxiety as an example. My childhood environment was filled with a lot of stress mm. with very limited resources to help me cope. So I felt very overwhelmed and very stressed most of the time. My cortisol was likely through the roof, my adrenaline through the roof, and my nervous system overactivated all of the time. From logical conscious mind, again, you would have heard this person proclaiming, I want peace, I want peace. So now flash forward in time, when say I find myself on a peaceful moment, you know, maybe I'm alone or maybe my partner's next to me, it's quiet, there's quote unquote nothing wrong per se. Mm -hmm. but I came to notice in myself is that I would, I would do one of two things consistently, more or less, in those moments. The first thing I would do is I would respond or react to what felt like an agitation in my body. It almost felt like I was crawling out of my skin with energy. It felt like, ooh, I got to get up and do something. And what I typically would do was clean. I would get up and first I'd be frustrated at the dirt that I had in the <laughs> A little agitated on totally. top of it. Before long, I'm cleaning around. Yeah. My house is spot clean, top to bottom. Or... If there was that person next to me, say it's my partner, maybe I wouldn't get up and tear around and clean. I might agitate the relationship because you know what just popped into my mind? That, that thing you said to me this morning, <laughs> I don't really love that you said that. So now's a great time to turn to you and say, why the hell did you say that to me this morning? And now before I know it, I might have agitated a conflict in my relationship. So observing mm. myself time and time again, what I realized was happening was we become so met, uh, familiar with these different physiological states that when we're not, say, activated, in that moment, my cortisol was probably lower than it typically was. My adrenaline wasn't spiked. Maybe my nervous system wasn't even fully activated yet. Though, according to my subconscious mind, that felt off, felt not familiar. It's not used to that. And according to my subconscious mind, anything that's unfamiliar is possibly threatening because mm. I don't actually know what happens next. My body knows what happens when I'm stressed. Mm. It, knows it goes into this dysregulation. It knows I do this thing. And it's comfortable with that only because it's familiar. Mm. So before long, what I came to realize was happening in that moment is what I call resistance. I was feeling uncomfortable with my new unfamiliar moment of seeming peace. So I created that same environment of stress that I was used to. Yes. So this all happens, in my opinion, to all of us, again, stored in our subconscious, becomes the reference point that we're kind of litmus testing what's happening. And when it's not familiar, a lot of us feel uncomfortable and then create often, more often than not unconsciously. It's not like I'm saying, oh, I'm uncomfortable. I need to stress out. I'm totally. <laughs> I need my you. fix. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just doing it. And then before I know it, though, I've confirmed myself. And I love that you're bringing up the physiology because I believe this is stored in our physiology and all of this, like I said, is happening outside of our awareness. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's really cool. There's, there's a lot of really cool movements going on. Um, in the social media world at the moment. And, uh, you know, people, those of us who are spiritually inclined see this stuff as, you know, you know, you can say it in so many different ways, you know, we're repeating the patterns because our, our higher self wants us to, 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 to be able to transcend and, and move on and deal with our karma. But then, and I love that stuff. Don't get me wrong, but I also really not only appreciate, but require people like you to explain it from the physiological neuroscientific perspective, because it's basically, you're talking about the same, the same thing, but, uh, in, in a, you can, you know, from a scientific perspective or from a spiritual and you know, whatever works for, for anyone works for anyone, but it's just good to know that this stuff actually is, um, empirical. It's not necessarily just, Oh, Hey, I can figure this out and then I'm good to go. You know? <laughs> I appreciate you saying that, Tom. And, and the reason I, I discuss the physiology, the science, and the empiricalness of it is because I've, I've heard from a lot of people of the shame that's carried around. 
Um, it's we, we do assign more a personal meaning to our continued struggles to change mm. to that pull that we keep falling back into. And I've heard a lot of us use the language of broken, I'm defective, something's wrong with me. I'm not meant to do X, Y, or Z because mm. I can't do it. Or I'm not meant for a fulfilling partnership because I keep picking this type of partner that's not fulfilling. So I share it and I'm happy you appreciate it because more often than not, there is a reason, a physiological, a nervous system, dysregulation, some reason why. And for some of us, that can be so relieving to yeah. hear that why, to be able to shift back and say, oh, okay, it's not because I'm broken. It's not because I'm unlovable like I suspect it. It's because I'm living in a dysregulated body and I can see a pathway to create regulation and balance. Because something I also have learned through living the experience, our bodies can have incredible ability to change. Just like we fired up and wired up all of those neurons in our head, we can create new pathways. Mm. We can teach our body how to gain comfort with new physiological experiences. We can create, in my opinion, an incredible change in our bodies. Mm, absolutely. You know, that's one of, that's um, the beautiful irony about data and empiricism is that it's, it's so connective in that way. You know, it's, you're not broken. As you say, these things that become so personal because we feel like it's only us who experiences these things, you know, it's just how the beautiful human system um, regulates itself in response to a uh, potential threat, you know? And one of the things that, um, a lot of people talk about is, you know, they have these big traumatic experiences and these acute moments that then shift, you know, do you find, and I, I, you're not really working with clinic clients specifically anymore, are you? Do you still do therapy? No. I don't do any of the individual work. Individual work. Yeah, cool. When you were doing your individual work, most of the time, did you find that people had to go through that blunt force psychological trauma before they were making changes? Or do you find that people can slowly progress? Because oftentimes people say, oh, you know, wouldn't it be good if I had known this before that big thing happened, you know? <laughs> I think it's both. Oh, okay, cool. I think for some of us, it is that big cataclysmic, life-shaking moment where life seemingly is turned upside down. Um, medical diagnoses, being left, death, lots of things um, can trigger that. For some of us, that is the catalyst to, to look um, and to begin to create change in our life. Mm. Um, for others, I, I lived a different journey. For me, it was a gradual accumulation of the effects of my habits and patterns that got to what one might say is a critical mass. Um, wouldn't necessarily say it was a big cataclysmic. I can't continue on, um, though just enough, uncomfortable enough, mm. um, in to open up the questioning um, of whether or not there could be change or could be different, which of course sent me down the path. And I've heard of, you know, equal both stories. Um, one thing I do know, that's an unpopular uh, opinion statement, what have you. I love unpopular opinions. What I, I know <laughs> doesn't create change is someone else yeah. pointing to you and telling you to change. Um, because change does require, um, in my experience, daily, consistent daily changes, efforts, new yep. choices um, that we have to maintain on our own in absence of that person who desperately wants us to change even being there. And I speak this because I know it's especially a natural human tendency, especially if you're seeing someone struggle and or we're struggling with someone in relation to them, we do want them to change. And maybe we do believe for their best interest, even that they should change. However, like I said, um, I do know that whether or not it's a big thing or accumulation of thing, it's not going to be someone else demanding you to do so. Yeah. Wouldn't it be lovely if that was the case though? <laughs> hey, Fix yourself. All right. I feel better already. Sure. Snap done. <laughs> yeah. That'll be $6,000. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, you've gone, uh, you've undergone lots of change. So you've moved to LA now. Do you live in LA? Uh, yeah. What's it all been like for you? How's the past couple of years been? It's been wild. Um, so, you know, for as long, well, not as long as I can remember, as long as I can remember, I was living in the city my whole life. So as I began to, to heal, um, and to travel and to, to get more grounded and connected with myself, I got really attracted to the West Coast, to life out of, you know, the Northeast, mm. which is all I do in my life. 
Um, interestingly, as part of my patterning, um, coming from a very enmeshed codependent family, as soon as I started to have those thoughts of, oh, I'll live somewhere else, they were initially squashed um, because I would run everything through the effect it would have on other people. And at that time in my healing journey, um, I wasn't comfortable with making choices based on what I wanted. Um, I made choices based on what everyone else wanted. Yes. At that point, I imagined my family would not be interested in me living across the country. So my even the decision to move, um, which obviously is several more years into my healing journey, doing some work, putting up some boundaries, changing some relational dynamics, stepping into my own truth and meeting my own needs finally allowed me to step into and actualize that choice to move. So I share that because the fact that I'm even out here now is really for me symbolic. Um, it's symbolic of me making a choice for me, mm. um, for the lifestyle that is more in alignment um, with my body, my needs and what works for me, even though, you know, I know a very real part of my family wishes I were still back home. Another part of, of my journey. So it's something we wanted. We actualized. We got the place. My partner and I, Lolly, we moved. And now yeah. here I am living in this beautiful place in the sunshine, exactly what I wanted. And lo and behold, I think as, as most of us humans experience, <laughs> it was still change. Yes. And it wasn't easy. I still had, you know, transitional things. I still, you know, had a lot of regression in some ways. I didn't want to do my daily habits that I had, you know, had in place for well over, you know, years at this point. I didn't want to do it. I started to order out more. I started to, you know, kind of shift into older habits um, that didn't don't fully serve me. Mm. So that was a surprising for me aspect of it. Um, I think by that point, I was like, yes, move everything positive. Off I am to go and live this life that I've been manifesting. Um, and it wasn't like that. And I understand for a lot of us that even changes that we're seeking come with difference. They're new. I'm in a new environment. And back to that subconscious, that mm. prefer, not new, um, it prefers the familiar. Um, I was met again with some transitional challenges with learning how to fully settle in um, and be here and create some new routines and habits and patterns that would work. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm really riffing on this idea at the moment of, um, balance. Oh, <laughs> is, is anyone else talking about balance? I think, you know, I think I've just reinvented the wheel, <laughs> but, um, you, you're so right, you know, with, with change, uh, brings, um, volatility and destabilization and confusion as well. I often find that, you know, I've almost just, um, put it into practice that whenever my, I move house, the first week's probably going to be just eating copious amounts of pizza. Cause I'm just like stressed <laughs> out. And exactly. Exactly. I actually find it quite difficult to fall back into my routine. It actually takes me a, at least two to three months. Um, I'm not sure if that's your experience as well. Do you find it takes a while? It does. It takes, I'm a, I'm a, I call myself a turtle. Um, nice. everything a bit slower for me. So creating routines, falling back in a routine, transitioning feelings, even they take a bit um, to settle. Mm. So yeah, um, I would agree. I think that what, what was different, um, for me this time, as opposed to past times, especially in the beginning when I was trying to create, um, a new lifestyle and create all this self into my life this time, I didn't worry that I wasn't going to go back. I knew I was, mm. I knew it was only a matter of time before either the accumulation of the gluten and the pizza <laughs> crept up with me and I didn't feel so good yeah. or, you know, not getting up and moving my body was starting to like creak in. I knew that after enough time or whatever the thing would be, I knew that the routine was waiting for me. Yeah. Um, I talk about, you know, developing habits and the value of not doing them every day mm. because when we don't do them every day, and even in, in the beginning, when it's very challenging to return to them, we're actually flexing a muscle. We're, we're showing and proving ourselves, and we're instilling some confidence, some trust, some the ability to decide. Because something I also am learning about being human is that we're actually not consistent creatures. I don't wake up with the same amount of energy and the same vitality and the same every day. I don't wake up the same every day. So I also don't think that just plowing through the routine because that's what I say I'm going to do, right, is, 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 is the end product or is the goal either. Yes. Um, so something I've learned in, in falling off routines is you gain the trust that you'll return 
And that trust is helpful mm. because there are days now where consciously I, for whatever reason, decide to not do this part of my routine or to take the whole day off for whatever reason. And similar to when I moved, I'm not fearful like I once was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, we're all kind of learning to be human, aren't we? It's just the, uh, the very slow process of figuring ourselves out, figuring what other human beings are like. And yeah, I, I, I used to get really attached to, uh, routines and, and my to-do list. I was so fucking obsessed and attached to my to-do list and just the crossing those words out was just, Oh, it was brilliant. It was just 14 pizzas in a row, you know, with the bottomless pit of the stomach. And, um, but of course, becoming so attached to that would make me very shitty to be around because if I couldn't get that done, if anyone was in my way, you know, if I had to walk the dog, <laughs> you know, I'd be like, what? This is bullshit. You know, so learning to kind of flow with those, um, those, well, learning to kind of flow with life, you know, really is, is probably one of the hardest things we can do. <laughs> or maybe that's just me. No, I couldn't agree more. I, I love to-do list. Um, I love this concept of done that I don't believe exists. Yeah. Um, and I also discovered very late on in life that even with to-do list, maybe some things we don't have a choice. Maybe, you know, you have to walk the dog or the dog will be in pain. Exactly. <laughs> However, more often than not, we do have actual choice. Yeah. And this idea of have to, because I, I too, very similar to you, it sounds like would just plow through and not even say, well, do I have the resources to do this today? Am I interested in doing mm. this thing today? Can I do this thing today? Here's a question too, I think, which is mind blowing for some of us. Do I want to? Yeah. <laughs> you exactly. know, engaging the possibility that the answer might be no, and that also might be okay. Now, of course, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying let, you know, things that are dire and will have dire consequences if we don't do them. So a lot of things I, I've learned fall into this. I don't necessarily have to. Mm. It can just be because this isn't resonating today. And I too turned into a not nice person because it didn't matter. I'd hate the world around me when I was doing something I didn't want to do mm. without considering that maybe I could wait for a moment where I, I wanted to, you know, it wasn't so intense, my dislike of this thing. Maybe like it would kind of be neutral tomorrow and I could do it. Yeah. I'm going to get give myself many of those opportunities to see that I have more choice than my relentless to-do list taskmaster self yeah. searching for doneness that doesn't exist right? Would allow. Exactly. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a momentary fleeting uh, feeling of satisfaction. It's like three minutes, like, oh yeah, I just wrote for four hours today. And then I'm like, oh, now I need something else to do. <laughs> and I'm in this terrible habit of just playing copious amounts of chess on my phone at the moment. I just play heaps of live chess. It's good. I get satisfied every time I win, but, uh, but, but of course there are some moments when for whatever reason, as you say, dire circumstances, or we have um, deadlines um, that we just kind of have to get this done. And you have a book coming out in the not too distant future. Is it 21st of March or 9th of March? March 9th. March 9th. That's right. Yes. That's in a month. I know. Oh, you must be excited. So excited. That's like awesome. A long time coming, yet still surreal as if it's not actually happening yeah. kind of in that weird place in the middle, even though I, I have the book right here holding it. Oh, cool. Look at that. That's it's awesome. Real. How right, here it is. Yeah. So it's, it's a wild experience. Very surreal. Yeah. Cause you were writing that um, all through the time that we were emailing. How did you find the writing journey? Uh, challenging, interesting, fulfilling mm. all the things. Um, it was, so a lot of the book, uh, it's me sharing my own story. And so a very big part of the early writing process was me thinking and dumping you know, my story. So a lot, I think more than I was expecting came up um, in those moments, mm. reading the book, you know, as I edited it and reading it was bringing up a lot. And then of course there's always that critical ego voice, um, you know, yeah, judging the book at every stage for every reason, whether it's the content or the language and there may or may not be a typo in this final version yeah. and that makes me want to crawl, you know, all the things. So <laughs> it, a lot's been packed up in it, <laughs> in the writing of it. Yeah. But you know, this is something that I really wanted to talk to you about. And uh, I, I love the title of it and I'm really looking forward to getting into this. It's actually how to do the work because there are, you know, I, I spent a little bit of time as a counselor and, um, 
there, there are really two sides to, to change or, or growth, you know, and, and one side is creating awareness, you know, whether it's through spending time with yourself or talking with someone or trying to unjumble the cognitive, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for dissonance or whatever it is. Um, uh, the strings of balls and thoughts. And then the other side is actually putting a plan together and actually going out and as you say, doing the work. So I'm, I'm really interested in what, where your inspiration came from for this book and um, some of the key points that we can all expect from it. If you can talk about that, are you allowed to talk about that yet? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. I love that you're, you're bringing up kind of the action, the actualizing of it. Uh, Cause in my old work um, with my clients week after week, um, I discovered, and I discovered this in my own personal life, and of course, some of my personal friends, how difficult that bridge is, mm. and how much, so many of us, how much insight, how much awareness a lot of us have, yet we're still unable to make that bridge and to build that bridge and to create the change in everyday life. Um, so for me, what the book offers, um, Instagram and social media, as I've been using it, in my opinion, is is invaluable. Mm. I mean, it's, it's my access point. It's the ability to connect with people like yourself um, now quite internationally. It's the ability for me to speak about these concepts and get these tools out there in a free and accessible way. So it's always going to be part um, of what I do and how I show up in the world. Um, though I understand that there's limitations in it. I mean, you know, you get a, a block and this amount of things, um, this amount of characters. So very early on, I, I was feeling the want, the desire to, to have a place where I could, from start to finish, talk about my model of holistic healing, um, our bodies, minds, and souls, and how our past experiences continue to affect us into the present. And then obviously, in my opinion, most importantly, how do we create change? Mm. How do we you know, heal from that past and, and create that future self? Um, so for me, putting that, I also love books. So the idea of a book was birthed very early. And yeah. I'm very thankfully and gratefully, you know, gained the opportunity of putting a book in action and into play. And it's been a long time coming. Um, and so for me, it, like I said, it, it offers my own narration of the model of holistic wellness with my own story of healing, as well as many others, clients I've worked with, um, other self healers in the community. And then at the end of each chapter to help us bridge that from awareness. So we can think about the, the chapters and the concepts, right? The awareness, understanding how our past informs our present. And then that bridge, each chapter, I include some actionable items, whether it's journal prompts or consciousness practices, how to translate in ego work. We talk about how to begin to befriend our ego. I have a chapter on boundaries. Mm. And aspect of healing our relationship dynamics. So I give boundary scripts, how to implement them in our relationship. So for me, that's the bridge. So we have the concept, let me understand and see this, witness these concepts in my life, and then let me build a bridge and begin to create action um, so that we can change our future. Mm. It's, it's, it's brilliant. And, you know, it, within, I suppose, the, the global culture, it's a relatively new idea, at least for, you know, regular civilians, not necessarily the psychologists and people that really understand this stuff. But most of us would think that going to speak to a therapist is doing the work, you know, and to some degree it is, or meditating is doing the work and to some degree it is, but what do you do with that awareness once you have it, you know, and so often people can get lost in that and they can end up speaking to therapists for years and years and years. Um, in the same way that someone can end up going to going to see a PT for years and years without actually considering why they're doing it and, and who they want to become or, or, or their goals, you know, what's that kind of point B. So I think the fact that you put both of those two together is, uh, is really important. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I would think a lot about that too. And, um, not to misunderstand, I, I, I know supportive relation. I know we're interpersonal creatures. We need other humans. We need safe relationships to express our authentic selves. And for those of us, obviously, who have the privilege and the access might find that someone in a therapist, a licensed professional, or any other healing practitioner or relationship of any kind. Great. If you have that, go get that. Utilize that. We need that. Mm. For many of us, that's our first relationship where we can begin to practice getting our needs met, showing up as our authentic self. However, the question always remains and did for me at the time when I was in practice, 
well, what is this human, myself included, doing the rest? Yeah. Right? Seemingly, we get an hour in front of these people or you have a great, you know, conversation with your friend for maybe you spend the day with them. What about the rest of the time? And what I found, the rest of the time, most of us at least, are slipping right back into our our autopilot, are living those old habits and patterns, aren't conscious to maintain those new choices consistently outside. So we're not translating maybe the new, say, tools that we're using in therapy to our best friend mm. or our partner. Um, and it's in those habits and patterns that we remain stuck. So I, like I said, whatever the helping relationship is, it's part of the story. Um, and the rest of the story, in my opinion, are the daily choices that we're making all of the time. Mm, mm. And that's, uh, in my opinion, the, the toughest part, you know, I know I shouldn't eat this. <laughs> I keep coming back to pizza. What the hell is going on with me today? I don't normally talk about pizza this much. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, I'm vibing pizza. Yeah. pizza. We should start it. Hungry, so maybe. Exactly. I, I know. So do we. <laughs> um, but uh, you're exactly right. You know, it's it's the habits and the, the 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 choices that we make that really well. That's what writes the book ultimately of our lives, isn't it? Yes, and that is the hardest. So I'm really happy you're speaking that, Tom, and I'll attest to that because we don't want to change, right? Going back to that, as I begin to act now unfamiliarly new, mm. as I begin to engage in new actions, as I begin to have a new relationship with my feelings, as I begin to express different sides of myself, to different people, my subconscious is still there, active, listening, watching, experiencing. And what it's registering is, whoa, mayday, what's this? Unfamiliar, unfamiliar, unfamiliar resistance back into familiar mm. we go. So you're, you're speaking a very profound truth when you're attesting to the difficulty of it. And again, evolutionarily, physiologically, we're not wired to change necessarily. We can, that's why we have that very powerful, you know, prefrontal cortex, the conscious mind. That's why we can create a world as we do different from other animals. We can change, so we need most of us to effort toward that change mm. through the discomfort of the unfamiliar. Yeah. I was reading a book um, called The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. I finished that a couple of months ago. He wrote um, The Coddling of the American Mind, and he's also written The Happiness Hypothesis. I think that's the right one. But um, the, he was talking about how the, the, the prefrontal cortex, the rational mind, and the mammalian brain kind of talk to each other because a lot of philosophers – you know, across the centuries and, and, and even for thousands of years, starting from Stoicism, used to believe that um, we, we are inherently rational um, robots, but we, we're, we're a slave to the passions. That was the phrase that I think one of the Stoic philosophers used to say, you know, if only we could just get rid of these passions that make us just want to have sex all the time and eat all the time and do all these things that, you know, aren't socially acceptable, you know, and what, what kind of bullshit is that anyway? But um what he's suggesting um, was that the rational mind is is more or less kind of a lawyer to the mammalian brain. And I really love this analogy because most of the time when we're feeling something, the our, our thoughts will kind of try to justify the way we feel. And it's so difficult, obviously, when we're in uh, arguments or disputes, especially with people that we love, because it's just like, how can you not see that I'm right here? And you're just basically justifying the way you feel. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why I love following your work so much is because we're really not going to get anywhere unless we deal with the feelings and the physiology and the emotions, because aside from that, you know, as you said before, you know, I wanted to be a hippie. I was just putting the peace sign up all the time. And yet I was locked in this stressful zone, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I go as far even to say that I, I think a lot of our system, school included, for most of us, over condition that rational part yes, of ourselves. Yes, totally. You know, you, we learn to look to our mind, to look to our thoughts to solve our problems. We learn to over intellectualize, to over rationalize. We do learn to do that. And then we practice that time and time again. I think then we do become the adult that's looking to that monkey mind to solve our problems. And we endlessly engage in those rationalizations. We, can, we become great lawyers. We can come with a court case for and against the same thing. Mm. And this is why a lot of us feel indecisive, unsure. We don't know where to go because we do actually, to some extent, 
feel pulled in two separate directions, or we feel so solid, solidified to one that we can't even entertain a possibility for another. Yeah, that's such a good point. Because yeah, we've we've really uh, yeah we put so much emphasis on the thinking part that's um so much younger than the feeling part. And the feeling part is how we navigate throughout the world. It's how we kind of fall in love and recognize who we like to be around and, um, having good guests on the podcast and everything. So yeah, it's, um, is that, a in, in the clinical world, is that registered? Is that, you know, is that, is that a big thing in that world or is that, um, not really spoken about much? The feeling. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just putting more emphasis into changing the physiology first before we're actually changing, you know, how we think if we can do that. I think it, it just to speak from my field, yeah. um, in psychology, I think a lot of attention is given to feelings, um, though not necessarily in it. I mean, cause what we're talking about here to some extent, right. Change your physiology. So I think you and I are inferring and I'll say directly sure. that one can do that. Yes. That one can have an effect on their physiology. Um, that's not the conversation that that's held in my field. Mm. The idea in my field is once physiology is controlled by forces outside of themselves, namely genetics, right? Neurotransmitters, things that I can't change or so we once thought. So it determines, and my, my job is just to kind of like make peace with what it is and what it is in. And I really don't have much choice or control. Mm. I obviously, and it sounds like you and a lot of us now in the field, believe otherwise. Yeah. We do believe we can affect change in our physiology. Um, for most of us, that means finding balance back to what you offered. Earlier. <laughs> I know I'm so smart. Our physiology first, right? Finding that peace, unhooking from whatever feeling we're stuck in um, so that we can return to a baseline and then being able to shift and change our physiology from there. So it's, it's, it, the feelings are talked about. Like I said, though, I don't think in a, in a change based way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting. Yeah. Ho- hopefully it will even just enter the conversation a little bit more in the not too distant future, but give us some of the practices now. So I, I noticed, um, after our first chat, um, on YouTube, we were giving, you were giving, um, breathwork exercises and, um, I actually heard you on your, Siobhan and I both watched the Lewis house podcast and, um, Siobhan's a breathwork, um, um, facilitator, when you were talking about breath work, we were just like hands up in the air. I'm sure we're reading pizza. I'm, I can't imagine why we wouldn't be, but, uh, talk about some of the exercises now to change the physiology. Yeah. Breath work is, 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 was my go-to. It was a foundational practice solely because we're always breathing. And I came to realize that the more intentional, um, I could be first and foremost witnessing my breath because what I realized and I still do it. I still catch myself doing it to this day. As I become stressed or as I become lost in thought somewhere else, I actually begin to hold my breath. Mm. It's not breathing. Um, not as I don't breathe as freely and as flowing from that deep belly space that I like to try and cultivate my breath. I actually kind of hold it or move it up to my chest. So witnessing my breath, and that just means dropping into my body now, even to this day, like I said, throughout the day. Um, and knowing that in those moments of stress, I'll catch myself. And in that moment, I was consciously attend to my breath. That was really, really foundational. Any sort of energetic movement can be helpful. Um, a lot of us house, you know, energy in our bodies and the more activated our nervous system is, the more activated our emotional system mm. um, because those two are connected. Something I've been, I actually love that you asked me this because I can segue into something I've been thinking and exploring a lot with myself. I've come to realize that as I start to get, and this could be even just excited because anxiety and excitement in our bodies are so similar that according to our bodies, it's the same thing. Our heart rate's getting a little elevated. Our breaths may be getting a little bit faster, a little shallow. So anytime I feel, we'll just call that that like kind of upward agitating energy. That's what my brain uses. Anytime I start to feel that inside, what I notice, and I've observed myself to notice this, I begin to talk faster. My, mm. my rate of talking increases. And if I'm moving, I'm Italian, so I also speak my hands. My <laughs> movements go quicker. Yeah, I'll start to play on my hands or I'll start to move quicker in my space. And what I realize that if my internal agitation is upping and if I'm moving quicker before I know it, I have a snowball happening and I'm increasing my agitation level 
And it becomes hard at that point to unhook it. Mm. And before I know it, I am in agitation, whether or not I feel like I'm anxious or I want to call it excitement at that time, I'm uncomfortable. And I share all of that because I've been experimenting with as I, because I'm dropped in, I'm connected, I, I'm starting to feel in my agitation. I can also now pick up on is my voice quickening? Is my, am I tearing around my apartment when I could really slow down? Yes. But I've actually been experimenting with changing my mood, my energy through slowing my motion wow. through when I see myself picking up pace in those moments, which I know is only going to lead to more agitation, ultimately more stress, maybe more anxiety. I slow down. Mm. I start to maybe intentionally now slow down my rate of talking. I try to well my hand, right? I don't tear into the next room. I try to calmly walk into the next room. And I've been experimenting with that sort of energy, A, awareness, because I was aware of my energy increasing, and now I'm becoming aware of how it can calm it as I slow it down. Yeah. And then manipulating movement, essentially. And um, how and have how you found it? Slow down fast and affect my mood. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And how have you found it? Because I, I can imagine I just the first thought that came to my mind there was, so often when people have those rage attacks, you know, in the car or just snap, it's usually because the stress is accumulated throughout the day. But as you're saying, if you can kind of tackle it head on when it goes from zero to one, as opposed to trying to attack it when it's seven to eight, you know, you're probably finding that you're not getting those outbursts as much, you're less frequently or whatever. Absolutely. And for some of us, that is the tool yeah. is to become so intimately aware of yourself that you catch yourself amping up because I know, I, I know this experience, I've lived it and I know many other people can resonate. There is a point of no return. Yep. There is a point of I'm so activated. It's only a matter of time or saying the wrong thing or not getting the amount of sleep. And I'm right back into those old reactions or behaviors or habits. So for a lot of us, that is the work because mm. so intimately aware of your patterns that you start to see the signals and they're different for each of us, right? You start to maybe see your sleep getting not as consistent. You start to see your energy level dipping, your agitation level going up. You can start to see yourself snipping just a little more on in an area where you might've had a bit more patience if you had your resources. At that time is the time to intervene now on yourself. Yes. It's the time to take a break. Is it time to say, you know what? I can't have this really difficult conversation that I know is going to activate me right now because I don't have the resources. Tomorrow or next week would be better. We intervene then as opposed to saying, well, I have to show up for this conversation, right? And now I have no resources and the conversation ends up in an explosion. Mm. Yeah. So what can people do then in those moments? Is it just as simple as taking a conscious breath or you know, some journaling or something that, you know, what's like a little tool or tip that we can do? Cause I'm hanging on for every word here because yeah, I get resentful at my dog. <laughs> I appreciate it. Depends on where you are on your, you know, emotional spectrum Yeah. Um, in the beginning, you know, catching it when I catch my first, you know, breath that I'm holding in some moments, that's enough. Oh, I'm conscious breathing into my belly. And now I've dissipated. That, mm. Right. If I'm a bit further along, it might have to be, a more drastic intervention, yep. right? It might mean leaving the environment that's activating me. It might mean putting up a boundary and being unavailable for the conversation that I know is going to be difficult until a later time. Um, it might be, you know, resting. It might be mm -hmm. replenishing my body because my resources have gotten too low because I haven't been taking care of myself. Um, again, this is where it's very much holistic yes. um, and individual. So the more you know yourself, and you might have to experiment. I, I didn't know my energy. I didn't know what was helpful. I dropped into my body and I experimented. When I first began to feel this agitation, I was like, oh, okay, maybe I'll go take a bath or I'll go do something, you know, quiet. That would probably be the worst thing that I could ever do. That just made me want to crawl out of my skin. When I'm feeling agitated in that way, as much as I hate to admit this and also hate to do it sometimes, I need to do something active. Mm. Something where I'm walking, even if it's slow, but where I'm doing something helps me so much more than where I'm stagnant. And I wouldn't have known that. And a listener might be the complete opposite. When a listener out there is agitated, it might be the best thing in the world for them to 
throw on a weighted blanket and sit down calm, right? But for me, that doesn't work. So it takes a bit of experimentation um, to figure out the tools that will work for each of us. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I think uh, I think I'm very much like you as well. We've, we're both like pizza. We, <laughs> uh, um, uh, but when I'm anxious or stressed, I think it helps me to flow with it, you know, as opposed to trying to bring it down. That's when I'm just get this real, uh, desire to head down to the mats and roll and do jujitsu, you know, or do something like that, that I can actually expel this energy or when, you know, I've I've had a coffee or, or whatever it is, you know, um, I struggle to go the opposite way. It's like, okay, I'm anxious. Let's bring it back down. And the anxiety is like, dude, we're fucking here. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> you got to roll with us. <laughs> That's a beautiful point though, Tom. It's surrender. Mm. I think a lot of us do complicate because for many different reasons, maybe again, a remnant of a childhood wound where we weren't allowed to express it in that way. I think a lot of us struggle because we battle instead of just dropping in, surrendering, you know, saying this is how it is right now. I don't know how long it'll last. I do know it will go away. And that's something we also train ourselves the more you drop into your body, and I talk about this in, in the book, there's a reality here on emotions that very few of us get to experience. And the reality being, they end. Mm. Our emotions, depending again on who you read, I, I cite a 90 second rule on or about 90 seconds is how long the actual hormonal and energetic experience of an emotion typically mm. lasts. However, let's bring back that monkey mind. Most of us don't allow them to just be a physiological event. True. Right. We don't allow them to come to an end because what we instead do, we have the feeling in our body, just like you beautifully said earlier, our mind is like, oh, right, you're agitated. And now we've brought it up to our mind and now our mind's involved and it's colluding and it's going to do something, create a story, relive the event, think about all the other times these things happened, whatever it's going to do, it's going to elongate typically mm. that emotion. And the reality for some of us, Tom, is that we've been living in emotions, not only hours, days, months, years, decades, lifetimes. We've been stuck because we're not just allowing them to be in our bodies and actually come to an end. I also imagine it would be hard for some of us as well to be assertive enough to create a container around the way we're feeling. Like I was just noticing that in in how I kind of respond to it and, and what you just said there as well you know, people that are perhaps, um, you know, more agreeable than others or that, uh, are still struggling with some things from the past of, of, you know, not having their needs met or whatever it is. The, the, the skill, I suppose, for them to say, Whoa, I'm actually feeling really anxious right now. I can't have this conversation. I've got to go and train or or do whatever I need to do. I I imagine even that would be really difficult. Yeah. I, a lot of us, you know, adopt habits and patterns, ways of relating, ways of denying to ourselves, to those around us, only showing parts of self that make everything we're talking about much more difficult mm. in practice um, than in, in concept. So this is like we're saying when we drop in and we begin to experiment with some of this newness, there, there are challenges. It is really, really difficult. It's also, again, you know, we are often in relationship with a someone else. And now we are yeah. contending with them and their past and all of the ways that they are activated in any given moment. Um, this is why it becomes very complicated and why a lot of us right, struggle to maintain the changes um, because we're so habited, we're so patterned, we're so uncomfortable and we're navigating the complexity of being around other humans that are going through everything like we are mm. in different contexts, of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's, that, that's why it's all fun though, isn't it? The journey. Yes. Right. <laughs> now that's, um, there's one other part of your work, uh, that I really wanted to talk about. Um, and it is the future journaling stuff. And I really love this thing because, uh, I, I, I got heavily involved into existential therapy for personal reasons. Well, I really struggled to kind of find myself, you know, and I was, I, I felt like I'd lost an identity, especially when things change in my life really drastically. And the future journaling stuff, I think is arguably, in my opinion, some of the most important stuff that you put out there because changing the physiology, dropping in, you know, all of that is going to help us deal with the present moment. Um, But the future journaling, I love it because then it becomes, well, what is my point B? Where am I aiming? Who who do I want to become? So how did you 
how did you formulate that future journaling stuff? And um, t- tell us a little bit about it. I began using future self journaling actually on my own journey. Um, when I realized how unconscious and habited and patterned I was. Um, so I just you know, started to engage with consciousness work, came to realize, like I said, that I pretty much like most of us am on autopilot. Um, I might birth an idea of this new thing I want to do and very quickly it's gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm right back into doing the things I always do. So I, I, I came up with, and I'm not someone who historically has, has journaled. I didn't have a journaling practice. Mm-hmm. However, I was reading about journaling and thinking of the ways that I could utilize journaling practically. And what I realized was there was, there was a way and I came up with some templates that I followed myself and then I honed and obviously then I released to everyone to use on their own journeys of how to use a practice every day of writing an intention to change and how to use that daily practice of writing the intention to do something different as a means of sticking to the habit creation. And then I learned about neuroscience and neurology and the ability, the magnificent ability of our brain um, and how powerful it can be in actually creating that change through imagination, through speaking as if this future time is actually happening right here, right now. Because our brain doesn't actually know the difference when we're imagining something and when it's happening in our life. And when we're imagining it, the neurons are firing as if it's happening in mm. life. So marrying those two ideas together, um, the templates, the, the purpose of it is, like you said, to imagine a future where something can be different. I suggest you start um, the practice with one intention, to change in one area. This is a versatile tool. I still use it to this day. I just change the area that I'm working with. I suggest you give yourself at least a month to work on this one area, depending on who you talk to Mm -hmm. um, habits typically take around 60 days. So you might want to extend it beyond a month. The point of the practice is every day to set the intention to work toward that future change, whatever it might be in your given day. And then you're, we're going to write it in the present tense, however, as if that future thing has already happened. Mm. Now, the benefits, like I said, in addition to firing up some new pathways, when I'm writing as if it's true, I'm firing it up in my brain as if it's true. The second value is if I've done this at some point in my day, I, I do my journaling in the morning. You can do it at any point in your day. What I've done in that moment is I've reminded myself. I've activated the intention to change. Because then that helps us to piggyback the practice. Because journaling is incredibly important. Like I said, neurology, like we're firing up some new neurons. You know, we're actually doing some work when I'm writing it yeah. down. However, I think like you and I are acknowledging together on this chat, things outside have to happen. So the act of journaling throughout my day or at one point in my day for a lot of us is the difference of remembering to do that new thing later. So it became a two-part process, right? Writing as if the change is already the case. So I will become more conscious. I will focus. I am, I am focusing on my breathing and I am conscious and present in the moment. That for me became the difference of remembering to do that throughout my day. Mm. And then the more consistently I rehearsed it in the morning and I practiced it throughout my day, the more consistently I was laying, laying down those new paths. Mm. It's it's great because it, it offers a a new way to do just basic goal setting, you know. Because it, goal setting is so disconnected, in my opinion. You know, it's just like, oh, wouldn't this be great if I had this and I achieved this, you know, somewhere down the line, <laughs> you know? But writing as if it actually happened, um, or as if it's already happened. Um, the two ways I kind of like it about it, it's it's. It, it, it gets you into the feeling of what it would be like if it actually happened first off. So it gives you that little hit of inspiration and, oh, wow, you know, this could actually really happen. But also gives me anyway the, the responsibility to make sure that I work towards it. You know, and I often found that when I was just doing normal goal setting, because I was so disconnected from it, I could always easily just justify putting it off to tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I love that you brought up the feeling aspect of it too. Um, cause not only can it be really practical too. Okay. Well, I have this goal out there. How does that look today? And I think that can like help us translate our goal. Cause I feel similarly goals to some extent can feel a bit far. 
Um, I know a lot of people talk about reverse engineering and the steps to get there. In a way, this is what we're talking mm-hmm. about. Okay, that goal, what does that look like today? Right? How do I change today so I can get there? Um, I think that's a really, a really you know, helpful aspect of it. And the fact that you brought up the feelings. When we're summoning that feeling, that burst of inspiration, the fact is if you are that person who feels confident in that moment already, you're changing your physiology. That's actually an incredibly powerful aspect of the practice. It is practice because mm. for a lot of us, the feeling, so for me, my stress, the feeling I'm trying to summon feels out there. It is far, right? It is a hard thing though. The more I can practice embodied peace, even in a moment where I took a nice deep breath and oh, I feel peace, but it's one second. I'm teaching my body how to now become familiar with that new experience, which over time will become more and more familiar. Mm, yeah, that's awesome. And it's practice makes perfect, isn't it? And I think that's a really good way to kind of bring it back, you know, bring about the physiology. And there's a, there's a good question, because uh, unfortunately I can't talk to you for the rest of the day, uh, bearing in mind that we're different time zones as well. So you start to get pretty tired in the distant future. Um, what, what's kind of your future journaling looking like now, without being too personal, of course, but what are some of your um, things that you'd like to have done, you know, uh, Hopefully, if this pandemic starts to go away, um, apparently in America, it's pretty bad at the moment. But um, yeah, how, how's it looking for you at the moment, future journaling? So each day, um, what I'm working on now in my future self journal, um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the heart, the heart space and the incredible power um, that is inherent in each of our hearts. So each and every day, um, I make the promise to myself and set the intention to be connected um, with my heart through the feelings of love and compassion and connecting with myself and with others in the world. So by extension then, in terms of what that means for me as a future self, um, continuing to be, you know, really heart conscious, um, both, you know, as a leader, as a human, um, putting my work out in the world, uh, and part of our, of the heart space, um, allows us to connect with others. Mm. So, you know, continuing on my journey of being a participant in all of these healing communities, um, just self healers movement in general and the self healer circle, um, and obviously creating more and more opportunities to, to connect with others and to heal together. So interestingly, so funny that thinking about in terms of what is my professional future self look like, how closely it connects into the daily work that I do just generally in terms of staying connected to my heart. Yeah, that's awesome. Now I've got to ask you a podcast question just to finish off here because uh, you're uh, you you're in a white room now, <laughs> podcast studio, I believe kicking one off. It's it's a podcast studio. Yes. Yeah. Who who would be uh, who would be your ultimate guest? Now obviously you can't say me. <laughs> aside not, from me, obviously aside from me. <laughs> who would be my ultimate guest? Um, I still want to have a chat with Dr. Joe Dispenza. Mm. I'm really influenced and think he's doing amazing work out there. Um, so I would definitely like to have a chat with him. That would be incredible. Yeah. He's awesome. Cool. Nicole, thanks so much for doing this. Um, I, yeah, I just can't get over the growth since we last spoke. And if it keeps going, this trend, um, I don't know if there'll be an Instagram anymore. <laughs> You're doing too much, but congratulations on all the work. I'm pumped for the book to, to come out as well. That'll be really exciting. Thank you so much, Tom, for having me, for being around back last year, geez, whenever it was, and just for your endless support. I really, really, truly appreciate it. Absolutely. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.